Get Up Nation. My name is Ben Biddick. I am the creator and host of the Get Up Nation podcast, where I serve individuals, organizations, and societies to develop and sustain resilience and perseverance. I'm the co-author of Get Up, The Art of Perseverance, with former Major League Baseball player and CEO of Ruron Living, Adam Greenberg. The Get Up Nation podcast is brought to you in partnership with GotYour6Coffee.com, where Navy veteran Eric Hadley is committed to serving first responders, veterans, and their families through a variety of nonprofit organizations. No stranger to adversity, Eric has fused the necessity of coffee with his passion for public service. You're already purchasing coffee. Why not empower your coffee with purpose? Why not purchase coffee that not only has your six, but also has the backs of those who don a uniform of service for our communities and great country? Learn more about Eric and his freshly roasted award-winning coffee at gotyoursixcoffee.com. Welcome to this episode of the Get Up Nation podcast. Today I have the absolute honor of speaking with Nick Wilson. Nick and his team are focused on ending the silent suffering of our country's first responders by providing peer support and funding for treatment, recovery, and psychological services. I look forward to sharing with all of you the power of those who step up to face the most distressing adversity our world can throw at us learn healthy ways of coping with trauma and persevering into the creation of a finer world. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Uh, let's get into this, um, the Resiliency Project. This comes from, from truly we're talking about true adversity here today. This is not for um, anybody who doesn't want to deal with the truth. This is the reality of what people face as they go into the first responder community and deal with the roughest things that people do to each other. And those in law enforcement and EMS who are on the streets and getting into this, um, it has a profound impact upon them and their families. And so, especially in the time of this coronavirus, this is a, a very timely conversation to be having. Um, I'm just glad you're here, Nick. And I just open this up to you to start to share some of your journey that led to the Resilience Project. Thank you, thank you very much. And I appreciate everything that you're doing as well, because I think that everybody who contributes to the conversation about destigmatizing mental health issues in the first responder community uh, plays an, an imperative role in the process, because I think it takes a village in order to break the stigma in the first responder uh, community. I was a police officer uh, in Orange County, California for 13 years. And due to the cumulative stress that I experienced on the job, I started to experience initially sleeping problems that became very much exasperated after multiple critical incidents. And after 13 years, I began a process of emotionally numbing myself out because in the first responder community, we typically do not talk about the things that bother us. And so I became pretty much a statistic. I became uh, chemically dependent on benzodiazepines and uh, those were prescribed to me for my sleeping problems after a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. And um, in 2016, I crashed my car because I was driving under the influence of alcohol, which I was using to nut myself out and sleep. And when that happened, I uh, got a DUI. I medically retired after the injuries that I sustained in the line of duty from my back and my arm. I, for the first time in my life, started to really understand the term suffering in silence. And here we are in uh, 2020, February uh, 4th, we opened the nonprofit organization uh, called the Resiliency Project. And our goal, as you stated, is to raise funds in order to redistribute those funds for any first responder in the country needing or requiring psychological services or treatment and recovery services. And uh, we have some pretty pretty amazing goals uh, this year and next year. And uh, we're not just gonna be redistributing those funds, we're gonna be building a campus. And that campus is gonna be a one-stop shop healing center that will also have a treatment and recovery uh, center on it. And 
any first responder that comes to us will be able to go through that program for free. And so, yeah, I, I'm very grateful to be on here and to discuss further with you uh, what we're doing and so some of the trends that I'm seeing right now in the first responder community. And um, that, that's the general background of, of me. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I don't think today people understand the amount of trauma that a first responders experience, particularly law enforcement, because right. you're going into homicide scenes, you're going into suicide scenes where people have been successful in committing. You're seeing, uh, you know, domestic violence incidents where families are, are uh, violence in the home, children are frightened. Um, you're seeing uh, overdose deaths from an opiate epidemic. You are under constant scrutiny, everybody picking everything apart that you're always doing. Every time you get out of your squad car or even while you're like every minute you're on the job, mm -hmm. uh, there is a lack of trust from law enforcement or uh, EMS supervision because of all of the scrutiny. So depending on the leadership style and the ways that these first responder organizations, uh, depending on the character and the integrity of the leadership and their ability to manage stress, there's all sorts of interpersonal conflict in these agencies that just oftentimes ratchet up or increase the stress that's already being experienced. Will you share a portrait or a window into what you're seeing now and how absolutely vital it is for our first responder community to recognize the importance of mental health? Yeah, absolutely. And those are all amazing and accurate points. I think that when we look back at 2019 and see that 228 police officers died by suicide and we see the trends in the last three years that more police officers have died by their own hands than in the line of duty, I think that that in and of itself is a crisis. I think that the culture in the first responder community has always been to stuff it, to not talk about the, uh, the experiences that they had, the critical incidences that they were involved in. Uh, for law enforcement in particular, there has always been this uh, code almost of silence in that the idea is, you know, if we discuss or e express how we feel after a critical incident, typically it has always been and still is today um, viewed as a sign of weakness. Right. Police officers go through an exorbitant amount of stress on a daily basis. Conceptually, we understand that. But when you really, really dive into it and you understand that multiple critical incidents and cumulative stress and exposure to the wrath of society, the heinous things that people do to one another. And you start to see officers throughout their careers being exposed to these things and then experiencing in their own lives, compassion fatigue, adrenal fatigue. Um, you see uh, them start to isolate all of these things are contributing factors that lead down the path to silent suffering. And when we create an atmosphere where police officers uh, and first responders do not feel safe to get the help that they need, we start to see their personal lives start falling apart. When they start isolating and depression sets in, their inability to sleep. These are all things that I experienced. And unfortunately, when that happens, the natural outcome that we have seen in the last, not just five years, but throughout the history of law enforcement, the, that silent suffering, while maladaptive coping strategies increase, it leads to suicide. And so from a leadership perspective, it's incumbent upon our law enforcement leaders across the country to start embracing this concept of, of destigmatizing mental health issues because in absent that the culture is not going to change and if the culture doesn't change we're going to still continue to see an increase in police suicides 
And so, go ahead. Yeah. So, my my um, my experience in my career as a police officer was, you know, we critical incident debriefing um, based off of the Mitchell model was a great concept. And when I went to a trauma retreat in 2016 called WCPR, that was the first time in my entire career that I was ever involved in a critical incident debrief. And we were surrounded by peers. There was only six people that go through the retreat at a time. Unfortunately, right now, there's an eight month waiting list. And so part of what we're doing is when we're building this campus is to create enough space where we, we're not going to have uh, uh, a waiting list and we can get m as many people in there as, as we can. But when I talk about critical incident debriefing and all the other treatment modalities that are clinically proven and evidence based that that really do help police officers and first responders. You know, we don't do, we don't, unfortunately, as a as a law enforcement community, we're not as proactive as we can be. And when we start seeing the things that we're seeing with suicide and mental health issues, this is this is much more than just um, a mental health thing. The the long term effects of police officers in not getting help has a, a ripple effect into the community. Society is not going to benefit by having sick police officers out there that aren't able to get the help that they need. And so we as a law enforcement community can do a lot more to change this culture around. I, for a long time, have said, and this is stuff that I've learned in my trauma work, especially when I started it at the WCPR. I've, I've long said that there's nothing more important in law enforcement than the need for peer acceptance and the need for peer solidarity. And we see that in, the, in all the things, even the small things. Um, let's, you know, let, let's say, let's get uh, an example equipment or something on a duty belt. Typically, when the new thing comes out, uh, then partners start getting the same things. That's that's a, just a small example on a micro level of peer acceptance. So what I'm trying to say is when, when one police officer says to another police officer, hey, that call didn't bother me, what you're doing and without them realizing it is invalidating the normal reactions to abnormal events that they're experiencing on the job. And when they start to feel that their partners are not affected, of which they are, um, that next poli that police officer, they're not going to go get help because they're afraid to. Mm -hmm. And it's incumbent upon all of us to start being more vocal, like you are. And um, that's the only way that I believe that we can effectuate change on, on a much larger level. I agree 100%. There, as you see this unfolding, as you see um, police officer uh, and law enforcement organizations developing um, programming like peer support groups, uh, emotional intelligence focuses, uh, resilience focuses, recognizing these things about incorporating into their daily routine uh, mental health um, practices such as mindfulness or mm -hmm. um, uh, things of those natures to help them process that trauma, being open about that trauma. How do you see this most successfully being infused into the community as it is? Like what are the first steps that are that are creating success or because uh, there is plenty of resistance, you know, currently the, that's the fact of the matter is. Right. Uh, there is a ton of resistance to this because it uh, it makes an intergenerational organization have to confront something that has been neglected whole like entirely yeah. uh, for a long time in a major in what I would dare to say is a majority of agencies. Yeah. So what is the first step in being successful 
with creating mental health within people who are being sent out daily into trauma? I think that the first step is to, number one, identify that there's a problem and vocalize it and not be afraid to say that we have a mental health uh, problem uh, and we we have a, a, a suicide problem in this community and to not be afraid to say it. I think that um, from there, that that's the initial starting point. I think that we're starting to see a, a lot of improvements in the country and around the country um, in terms of developing peer support teams and doing a lot more training, both at the academy and in uh, post-certified training courses. Development of peer support teams and implementing best practices um, for peer support is absolutely vital to the success of not just peer support, but turning around the suicide rate. Um, so I think that, um, you know, one of my board members uh, who I'm so fortunate to have on the team is Dr. Heather Williams, who used to be the peer support coordinator of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Um, she recently opened up her own private practice, uh, but she essentially has went around the entire county and developed the peer support teams at those agencies. Um, the more our leadership in law enforcement buys in on those um, peer support measures and implementation of mental health programs and creating a pathway that is easily accessible and that is confidential, um, I don't see as a country things changing until that becomes the standard practice and the norm. And I've long said, you know, I've always said, you know, we don't see this kind of stigma with doctors, attorneys, teachers, or any other profession, right? We see this in a alpha uh, dominated type A personality environment where, you know, talking about things has historically been taboo. So I think identifying the problem, being vocal about it, not being afraid to say that we do have a problem and identifying areas in, uh, where improvement can be made and then bringing in the right people to be change agents in a culture that desperately needs change. Absolutely. I love I love that you 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 hit on the concept of true strength. It is not strength to just stuff it down, to 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 drink it, to try to drink it away, to um, try to, you know, just you'll never well, we will never be strong enough to do that because it's not something you go home and go to bed at night and sleep like a baby after you have just done CPR on a baby who didn't make it. You heard the sounds of the family screaming. You have smelled the blood. You've seen those things. You can't, we are not strong enough to deal with those things uh, without talking about it, without processing it, without developing healthy coping skills to process that in a healthy way so that we can move on uh, in a healthy way to deal with our own families. Because the next time we see a child that age, that's what we're thinking. It's important for, um, for people to understand that true strength and health is about talking about those things, Absolutely. processing them in a healthy way, because the next time you go, you will know that not only are you stronger and more able to deal with the stress and trauma of future similar situations, but you actually do have a partner uh, in your coworker who is there to help you process it after, because it just doesn't happen when you clear the call. It you it happens. You experience that call ongoing unless you process it. And to have a true partner who who realizes that, who experiences that themselves, and is open about that, you create a profound strength, a true strength within your group. And then when you have that internal to your organization, just look at how that. I mean, you you probably know this better than I do, but what a picture that paints exterior to the organization. How does right. that improve their service to right. their community? 
uh, when they see other people who are experiencing a mental health crisis uh, and, in, you know, and how the ability to have empathy, the ability to connect with those you're serving, I think, especially of crisis negotiators, I think of the patrol officers trying to resolve the dispute, you know, on the street. These are, this is true strength. This is real strength. Absolutely. 100%. Couldn't agree more with you. And I think that, you know, I was just having a conversation actually with a very dear friend of mine yesterday, who is my retired police chief who um, has experienced a lot of trauma himself. And I was saying, you know, how, how significant it is to be able to be strong enough to be able to identify that you have a problem and then seek help and it not being a sign of weakness. And I'll, I'll say this, in this conversation that I was having with him yesterday, I said, the warrior mindset is something that is indoctrinated in a police officer in the academy, just very much like it is in the military, right? To be able to have a warrior mindset and be able to push through any sort of attack or overcome a threat of violence in the line of duty. But part of being having a warrior mindset means, hey, if you can identify that something is bothering you, and a lot of times people can't identify, like I couldn't identify at the time what was bothering me. I didn't know why I couldn't sleep. I didn't know why, I didn't even understand the term hypervigilance. I didn't understand why I started getting um, all of this anxiety, where it was coming from. I didn't understand what it meant to be triggered by something. You know, you were talking a lot about smells and sounds and all that stuff. And a lot of times that, you know, something as small as the smell of uh, something being burnt or, you know, something like that can trigger past events. And in that, um, the body stores those memories, right? And what happens is when you're triggered by those things, it the memory comes with the same magnitude and intensity that you felt at the time that the critical incident occurred, right? So I never understood it until I started doing my trauma work. But in order to have a warrior mindset, that doesn't mean just being able to um, you know, overcome and never give up in the middle of a fight. That means mental preparation, and constantly assessing and evaluating where you're at psychologically and emotionally and to be able to be strong enough and have the intestinal fortitude to be able to get the help that you need in order to truly have a warrior mindset and so you know i i am um, in my career um i i experienced a lot of trauma i really really you know looking back um I, I thought that I was okay. I thought that, you know, I'm a police officer. I, I believed from the academy I was invincible. I was indestructible. I was invulnerable. And that wasn't the case. I was completely vulnerable to the impacts of trauma on law enforcement. And, and it wasn't until I lost everything that I realized um, I need help. I need I need to I need to completely um, start over. I identified myself as a police officer, not as Nick Wilson, not as you know a, a brother, a son, or a father to my boy. I was Nick the cop, and we we sort of have an identity crisis at times. You know what I mean? Um, and we become so much uh, immersed in the profession that sometimes we forget who we really are and we, we start neglecting ourselves, our nutrition and, um, you know, it, it goes down the drain. Our, our daily living habits, you were talking about mindfulness. I never understood anything about mindfulness, mindfulness and me meditation, but that is, it is such a powerful component to the overall success of your mental health. And so, you know, there's so many, I, I've also said before that, you know, trauma and, um, you know, post-traumatic stress is not just uh, something to be looked at or approached from a psychological perspective. 
when you look at a brain scan of a normal brain and one that is affected by uh, post-traumatic stress, you can see in the brain scan the abnormalities that exist. And so, you know, that's why it's important that we as a community, we, we create a community of understanding that post-traumatic stress is not a disorder and post-traumatic stress is an injury. It's a brain injury, just like TBI. Okay, so when we approach this from that perspective, it becomes easier to destigmatize things, right? Right. And if we can create that community of understanding, hopefully we can reach more and get more uh, police officers to realize that there's nothing wrong with them. Okay, there's nothing wrong with them because they have been affected and injured in the line of duty. Um, so, you know, it's not just a, it's not just psychology. It is a science. You you look at adrenal fatigue. You look at compassion fatigue. Cortisol levels go out of whack. Stress hormones are um, increased. I mean, so if you if we start working together from a holistic approach. Right. And we improve our nutrition, diet, diet and exercise, mindfulness, and really get into the trauma work, uh, not just doing talk therapy, but doing exposure therapy and EMDR and neurofeedback. All of these things help to advance um, your mental health. And I think that we need to start prioritizing those things from the academy. Moving forward, um, we need to be able to reach our recruits from the academy day one so that when they get to those critical incidents in, in their careers and go home, they can identify more easily what's really going on with them rather than being confused like I was. Right. Yeah, you're revolutionizing the world. You, I can't wait to see where, where you're at in five to ten years because uh, this has profound this, and I'm calling it right here, that in five to 10 years, the work that you're doing, uh, it just has a profound revolutionary change to um, to our communities and where, where young men and women decide, I am gonna put my own safety at risk and I am gonna go out into this community and serve it. And I am going to hold people accountable for the wrongs that they do. I'm gonna find solutions for deep seated community problems and help solve those problems. And for for people for people like you who are committed to creating healthy men and women who do this job consistently, because most people do this job for you know two two to three decades before before they retire, you're creating these people who are so self-aware have a true concept of mental health. And when I say mental health, I mean what you say the holistic the truest sense of health because the mind and the body are not separate. We, you know, the medical community frequently, I, you know, be categorizes into physical health and mental health for a variety of reasons, which is frustrating. But the fact is the way our minds work affect our bodies, the way our bodies work affect our minds. And when we send people out into these traumatic situations, risky situations, violent situations, to give them the ability to truly be healthy throughout that career, you will change so many lives. You will save lives. You will save families. You will save uh, children from being exposed to all of the symptoms of, of a parent who's going through that, that very troubling reality. I am very excited about that work that you're doing. Where is this campus that you're creating? Is Do you have a location yet or no? No, we don't have a, a location yet. And a lot of obviously with everything that's going on right now with COVID-19, uh, I have uh, directed uh, the team to halt fundraising efforts and focus more on peer support. It's uh, distasteful and, in my opinion, um, not the right time uh, to go out there and fundraise. But once uh, we get through this as a country, our fundraising efforts are going to continue, of which are very aggressive. And when we uh, build that campus, um, it'll be somewhere in Southern California. Uh, we don't know where yet, but the actual development, uh, the, the actual plans of it uh, are are created and it's, it's gonna be absolutely phenomenal. And I wanted to touch on what you were just saying, and I appreciate your words 
but it's important to understand that there's no way I could be where I am now, um, both with my own mental health and w the success of the Resiliency Project without the team. And the people who have entered my life uh, and this organization at this time are all equally contributing to the success of what we're doing. A lot of the work that I studied and learned in the last four years comes from Dr. John Violanti out of the uh, University of Buffalo, who essentially wrote the book on police suicide and police trauma. <clears throat> the people that are on the team that are in New York, um, Megan, who is an incredible asset to us. She owns a yoga studio and has been fundraising for us in the last several months. Um, all of the people now to include this board of which I couldn't be more proud of and more humbled that they are on this team are all playing a collective effort. And the, 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 the important thing to remember is that it can't just be the resiliency project. We have to, as a country, be able to come together here in order to effectuate the kind of change that we need. And so it's not one person. This is something that is much bigger than any of us. And in order to achieve the outcomes that we need to, we have to be able to work together on all levels, not just with the government, but nonprofit organizations and private business people. Everybody needs to come together like they have at any other point in history when other uh, subgroups within our culture have needed the kind of support that, that they needed. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is something that is going to take a while. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, the, I make these videos, right? I initially started making videos on my phone in order to destigmatize things. And I started making those videos um, for my son when my uh, wife left uh, after asking for a divorce and my son left uh, the house. And I was sitting here all by myself and I was thinking to myself, what happened? And how did I lose everything? I family disowned me. My brothers encouraged me to take my own life when this happened three years ago. And I'm sitting here and I'm wondering, like, how am I going to make it through? I, I, I had to start practicing what I learned at the trauma retreat. And I had to stick to a very stringent process every single day. And it wasn't until um, I was being hired to consult uh, private companies on developing a first responder program that was culturally competent in order to treat them and seeing some of these companies not do the right thing. And it was all about money. Did I realize we need a nonprofit organization that's going to start taking action steps and start doing things the right way because our first responders and our police officers who serve every single day in this country deserve to be supported in a way that they're gonna get the best treatment possible and they should be getting it for free. And I have said before, the military of which I am an, an incredibly ardent supporter of and love our country and our military, they have a lot of resources. It wasn't always that way. And I think over the course of time, we had to learn the hard way that we weren't treating our military right. Uh, what we saw in Vietnam and when those soldiers came back, was uh, absolutely atrocious. So our police officers out right now serving and protecting our communities and are getting water thrown on them, rocks thrown at them, um, constantly uh, ridiculed, scorned, and denigrated by either the public or the media at times, unfortunately. Um, they're having to come home and they're bringing all that with them and the families are affected police spouses are affected and it creates all of this turbulence at home and and it basically breaks down the family structure when um, trauma enters their lives and it goes untreated for a long period of time and so uh, i think it's important to remember that the military goes overseas to protect our country and they get to come home and our police officers are home and look at how they're treated.
And um, this is something that needs to change. It has to change. And and that's where um, my passion lies. This is my life. This is my mission now. The Resiliency Project, um, it, it's not going to go away. It's only going to grow. And we're not going to rest until we start seeing change. I love what you said a little while ago. You said that that's good that we honor the fallen, but you're here to honor the living. Yeah, absolutely. Them by getting these brave men and women the support that they deserve. Um, absolutely. I think, I think that's well said. Well, you, you know, here here's what we've had historically in the police culture. We've had a suck it up mentality. You've had an environment where you are ostracized if you express how you feel about a critical incident. I mean, how else is a human being supposed to feel when they see parts of brain matter on the ground after a gunshot wound to the head or a child death or feel after a 45 minute pursuit with a man with a gun that doesn't want to go back to jail? When you see those things, it's, it, you know, <laughs> Um, it has an effect on the mind and over the course of time left untreated, it's going to catch up with you. Yeah. And, um, we have to start creating an environment where police officers feel safe to be able to get the help that they need. Yeah. We, uh, we want, look, I, it's hard for me to ever go to a police funeral anymore. I mean, I've been to quite a few in my career. Um, hard for me to even hear bagpipes. Our police officers are seeing the worst of humanity every day. And in order to honor the living, we have to be able to pull together and be give them the resources that are easily accessible. And um, it's a it's a multi-component approach, in my opinion, by number one, destigmatizing things and also providing the resources. And so you know, it's not just me here. It's not just uh, the Resiliency Project. There are tons of other organizations out there that are also trying to do the right thing. And it's also people like yourself who have a platform to be able to discuss these things. And the more people jump in to the arena and start, you know, <laughs> uh, start contributing, yeah. the more I think we'll see change. Yeah. I just say, and well, as you made that list of the stressors that those officers face, high speed pursuit, doing caring for children that are severely injured, uh, and dealing with severe acts of violence. And then what can even compound that even worse is when they don't have a supervisor or leadership that shows up in a way that is caring and supportive of them in that way and their mental health who then treats the officers themselves like suspects. And, uh, and, and then that, you know, where, where there are leadership deficiencies where uh, we're stressed from on high, where, where decades of trauma is then channeled towards their fellow officers and creates a highly volatile environment where you're facing all these things and officers on the street then feel frightened of what's behind them and frightened of what's in front of them yeah. and you're, you know yeah you're you're hitting it right on the head you know a lot of people don't realize that organizational betrayal or perceived organizational betrayal mm -hmm. is enhances and exasperates post-traumatic stress symptoms okay it's a very real thing and um that's something that is in the textbook uh, when uh, you go up to uh, WCPR's uh, trauma retreat, uh, I, I'll say this, there is hope. And I think yeah. we are seeing a lot of uh, signs that our, our culture is changing. Um, I recently uh, have been uh, speaking with quite a, quite a few different um, uh, police officer associations and le uh, people at various leadership levels and was very, very encouraged to see that um, you know, the California Department of Corrections unfortunately has had 13 suicides in 2019. They already are at eight right now. 
And so for a culture that typically has remained silent, I was very inspired to see their association called CCPOA uh, release a, a letter yesterday acknowledging for the first time, hey, we've got a problem. And what they did was they released this letter to their 30,000 sworn, basically saying, there's a problem. We see it. We hear you. We see you. Um, we're going to do something about it. And we're going to provide uh, peer support and whatever sort of, so, uh, I'm sorry, whatever kind of support needed in order to enhance the mental health um, initiatives and programs that we have. And they're going to essentially overhaul their peer support programs in order to um, make it easier and uh, more uh, accessible. And they're going to create uh, an entire new mental health um, program and initiative to try to stop and reduce silent suffering and, and police suicide in their department. And for an organization that is as big as they are, that was an incredibly uh, inspiring thing to see. So hopefully um, we'll, we'll start to, to see that kind of change throughout the country over time. And I think it depends on where in the country you are. I think that there are a lot of agencies that are very far behind and have a lot of room for improvement. Um, you look at the El Monte Police Officers Association. They are the first police agency in the country who um, came to us and said, we, 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 we support this, we support this endeavor. Uh, and so their membership is donating individually every officer in the in the membership is donating one dollar a month which is inconsequential to them but they're doing it and that does two things number one it obviously it helps the resiliency project in trying to and expand to build this campus but two it also shows support and solidarity right and so when we see that kind of change that's amazing and uh, i'm fortunate you know yeah i mean so there's hope but we, this is a fight uh, that is going to continue. Uh, there's no illusion about how difficult this is going to be. Uh, right. This is, this is, you know, I'm not so idealistic here that I, I don't realize or recognize how, how, how tough it's going to be. But we're going to, our, we're, we're going to display the leadership as an organization required in order to achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves. And we're not gonna we're not gonna be silent about the issues that are occurring in our country. Um, you know, you think you think of um, when we see things in the media of a police officer who's making a mistake or doing. And by the way, I'm not condoning bad behavior. Number one, and I absolutely recognize that there are uh, people in law enforcement that should never be in law enforcement, nor do they deserve to wear the badge. Right. Just like in every other profession, there are crooked doctors and attorneys and teachers. Um, but when we see police officers making mistakes on the street, I wonder at times how much of that could have been prevented yeah. if that officer um, was actually getting the help that they needed, how much of the contributing factors of post-traumatic stress symptoms bled into poor decision-making while on duty? Um, and so that affects the community, community relations between law enforcement and the individuals within those communities. How do we improve those relations? Well, I'll tell you, a lot of it has to do with helping our police officers get better. So they're getting sleep and so they're not so stressed and they're not um, numbing out when they go home or isolating and becoming um, statistics. Right, right. Nick. I always end the show with six questions to help my listeners understand the why within my phenomenal guests. Will you run through these six quick questions with me? Absolutely. Who are you thankful for today? Oh boy. Um, uh, my entire team. Um, I, there's not one individual. I'm, I'm from my board, uh, our uh, administrator, uh, Ashley and uh, Megan in New York, uh, I'm thankful for Gina Marie, who's a police officer and clinician. Um, 
everybody on this team, I couldn't be more thankful for. And now that we've covered who you're thankful for today, what are you thankful for today? Being alive, being here today. And how do you fuel the fire within you? I've learned to pain, uh, to shift my pain that I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I've, I've learned to channel that pain and use it as fuel as it, I've learned to take my pain and shift it to gratitude. And I use the pain as fuel to push me forward every single day. Love it. What is one thing adversity taught you to value? Time with my son. What are you doing today? You may have never thought you could. <clears throat> Be on a podcast with someone um, I've never <laughs> uh, <laughs> met before and uh, never really had an experience like this before of which I'm very grateful. And what will you do tomorrow that you may have never thought you could? Use my experience from my career to help another police officer and be able to share those experiences of which are very personal in order to try to save their life. Nick, how can people learn more about you and your amazing work? Uh, they can go to our website at www.theresiliencyproject.info and or to our Instagram account, um, which is the underscore resiliency project. And um, we're just, I'm very grateful to have been on this uh, show with you and thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing as well. It all takes right. a it takes uh, a community of people to do this. So thank you for what you do. Absolutely. It's my honor.